very helpful robots rolling around uh, uh, in, in front of, uh, in, in the common area, inside the, uh, the conference room uh, early in the day. Those come from Omni. And uh, I would like to welcome to the stage uh, Dr. Thuk Vu, uh, co-founder and CEO of Omni Labs, the maker of these awesome robots. Um, he uh, got his PhD from Stanford, uh, follow, uh, following his uh, bachelor at CMU. And um, he's been uh, uh, a really awesome entrepreneur, entrepreneur as well as social um, activist in the field of education, especially in Vietnam, where he has made his uh, um, great impact through um, his work in, um, in the Viet AI Foundation, as well as um, through his association with the uh, von Neumann Institute of the Vietnam National University. So, uh, very excited to have you here, Thich. Uh, thank, you. thank you for the very kind uh, intro. Uh, you guys can tell that I'm old, right? <laughs> well, what you said. Uh, it's hard to go after like the two excellent you know, uh, speakers, but uh, I'll try my best. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Thich, and I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of Omni Labs. Uh, Omni Labs is a, a robotic company, and uh, we were founded in 2015 with the idea of building uh, service robots for social settings. Things that can be running around in schools, uh, hospitals, restaurants, home, uh, to help people do the task. Right? And so, you know, telepresence is one of the things that we started out uh, to build. Uh, you, you probably already saw some of them running away, uh, running around today. Uh, we started to venture into healthcare in 20, uh, actually, uh, and towards the end of um, 2020. Uh, after the pandemic. And so personally, I actually went through two uh, major peaks of the pandemic. The first one in the US, 2020, and the second one in Vietnam in 2021. And, you know, I really experienced firsthand how the whole healthcare system were really strained, right? and the staff uh, overworked. And so that's when we started to get the idea of uh, building different types of robots to serve within the healthcare system. So the... Uh, can we switch to the slide? Um, so one of the um, uh, first robots uh, that you know uh, get us venture into this space uh, is what we call the uh, UV disinfection robot. Um, so UV disinfection robot is a robot, it's an autonomous mobile base uh, that will be roaming around using UV light to disinfect the space. So UV light is very effective against killing pathogen, whether it's bacteria or COVID viruses, uh, but powerful around human being. And so it's a perfect application for autonomous robots. And so essentially, uh, we've been building this uh, autonomous base, and so we just tack on these UV components uh, so that it can help with disinfecting, uh, you know, operating room, patient room, uh, even like schools or offices. Uh, so that's our robot. Uh, just a little bit, uh, quick point on why does it matter. So, you know, like after the pandemic, things don't really get better uh, for the healthcare system. They're actually getting slammed on both sides. On one side, the huge increase in demand for care. Um, but then on the other hand, uh, they, you know, are getting uh, shortage of labor, rising labor costs. And so it's putting a lot of strain on it. But on top of things, there's something called healthcare associated infection. Basically, you going, uh, you, a patient going into a hospital, getting treated for one thing, and then got infected by another thing. And so this is a big problem because, uh, you know, uh, the patient will, you know, of course, suffer, right? Uh, but then, you know, you have, you have to, like, um, put up a lot of resources uh, already on top of the strain system in order to treat this patient. So the cost is about $30 billion a year uh, just with the medical cost alone. And then hospital will have to deal with multi-million dollar lawsuit and penalty. Uh, so this is a, a serious problem that uh, they're trying to address. Okay, so um, with an autonomous solution like ours, uh, essentially allowing the hospital uh, to really use the robots to disinfect the room rather than rely on human labor. Uh, so how does usually an autonomous robot would navigate? Uh, so this might be repetitive to a lot of you here, but um, basically the robot will have to combine different kind of sensory input 
uh, whether it's from LiDAR, death sensing camera, GPS, odometry, and then using some sort of algorithm uh, to really figure out where they are in the world, uh, localization, and what is the map of the world mapping, right? You know, uh, typical slam or B-slam. And then if the robot is new to the space, and it will have to roam around uh, to start building out the map, just like a roof, uh, so it's like a random walk, and you try, you know, just like uh, cover as much space as possible. Uh, and then you repeat, you know, based on the landmark and features, uh, the robot will try to figure out where it is, and then, you know, try to make a move uh, towards the target, and then, you know, repeat the localization uh, again. And so that's a typical process uh, for a robot to navigate itself in the world autonomously. All right, so uh, here's a quick video of uh, how the algorithm works. So you can see this is uh, work done by a company in Korea. Uh, yeah. And uh, basically, they're using multiple cameras to get in, the, in order to map our space and localize uh, the uh, person who actually carrying uh, the camera. Uh, so you can see the map getting built out on the right hand side uh, with all different you know, the depth uh, information and things like that. Okay, so this is great, right? So this, you know, at least we have some framework to start with. Uh, but using this algorithm is uh, quite not. Oh, so you know, in order to develop this, uh, so the common approach would be uh, first you decide on what kind of sensors uh, you want to put on the robot, um, the number of sensors, the types of sensors, and where you put them, um, and then you start using some of the existing framework like ROS to scaffold this way, you know, to build out the system. Uh, and then use some packages like SLAM or VSLAM uh, in order to start, you know, really just testing out uh, all of this navigation. Uh, so this is a common approach, um, you know, for anyone who wants to start building an autonomous robot. Uh, one way that we are, you know, doing a little bit differently here is that uh, we're building uh, prototypes using 3D printing. We actually 3D print, you know, the parts of the robots and combining with the sensors. Uh, in order to quickly make these prototypes and then deploy and test them in parallel with simulation uh, and then rinse and repeat uh, based on you know the failures uh, that we see uh, in the field and in simulation. Okay, so you know we started out with this, uh, but we realized that this is not enough uh, for healthcare environment uh, for uh, quite a few of the reasons, right? Um, so especially you know applicable to disinfection. Not all surfaces are created equal. You know, there's certain high touch surface that you really need to target uh, with the UV. Um, turnaround time is very critical. Uh, so you know, the hospital has over one, right? So usually they will have about five to ten minutes uh, to clean the operating room between cases, which is crazy, right? You know, you have to clean all that blood and fluid and then disinfect on top of that, and so they don't have any basically no time at all. Um, and people are you know, very busy, so they don't want to work with you. <laughs> Especially they don't want to train your robots or you know, babysit your robots while it's training. Um, and then uh, things are very dynamic. You know, so for example, the uh, disinfection requirements are actually depending on uh, the pathogens uh, and the protocol. So it varies per patient, per hospital. So some hospitals are a lot stricter uh, with the protocol uh, versus the others. And then the layout of the hospital often changes. And so the ability to remap uh, quickly and easily and you know selecting the type of disinfection valve on the fly for the operators is uh, very critical. And so all this boils down to the, this complex knowledge and protocols for infection prevention uh, in the dynamic environment. So this knowledge is really hard to sort of combine and, and, and learn autonomously. So, uh, but we do have an expert in the room. That is the operator, right? The person who has been disinfecting all these uh, operating rooms or patient room day in day out. So what we came up with was what we call a quick map algorithm. So basically allowing the operator to push around the robot uh, and you know learn the route from the pain, from the person. So just push around the robot once in the room, and then they can actually select different kind of disinfection spot. You know where you know you really need like the robot to extra back uh, the surface, 
And you can see the mapping built out here in the middle. Uh, just enough so that the robot can localize. And so the whole process usually will take you know, less than two minutes uh, for an operator to train a disinfection uh, of a room uh, layout. And you can see the route things are uh, you know, building out and recorded onto the robot. Very simple. Okay. So what it is was, you know, really we are learning from the expert and allowing them to set up, run, and rerun the disinfection uh, anytime they want. And they can disinfect exactly the right spot because they can select, you know, where the robots need to stay longer uh, to provide an extra dose of UV light. And most importantly, it's actually very flexible and error tolerant. Uh, these operators are non-technical, right. so we have to come up with an interface that's you know that's simple to use. And if you know they do something wrong, then you know we'll we'll just allow them to redo the routing and the mapping. Okay, so that's for setting up, right? But how do we continue to keep improving uh, the autonomy side? Because you know essentially we'll have uh, corner cases, we'll have failed cases. So you know, there are a couple of different interesting characteristics of the, the, this use case, uh, especially the hospital environment. So, you know, first of all, Wi-Fi is very spotty. Uh, you, need, you need to deal with privacy compl compliance, and, you know, the operators are usually non-technical and, you know, very under pressure, um, and so they don't have any patience. And then, uh, intersensibility of the hospital environment. Uh, it's hard, actually very hard to go in there and take a look at the environment uh, because you know most of the time it's very busy and you know same thing, they don't allow engineer you know to come in and out uh, that easily. So what we came up with was a uh, cloud-based robot management infrastructure uh, that robust enough so that we can you know collecting data and you know help keep improving uh, the autonomy stack. So there are a couple of things that we view back into the infrastructure. One is access control. Uh, with you know ID cards or codes, so that operators can log in and identify themselves and, and start using robots. Uh, they can then you know select the disinfection route based on the group layouts, the pathogens, the protocol, and then the the platform can communicate uh, with the operators as well as the management team via text messages or the hospital management system. This is very important, right? How to fit into the workflow. And then, uh, last but not least, we continuously collect different data so that we can provide reports and analytics. That is, for example, the sensory data of the robot, you know, just the depth uh, information uh, or light information, no camera, uh, RGB, um, uh, live feed, right? Uh, operator's feedback, uh, that's simple, you know. Does it work? Does it not work? Uh, some notes. And then some route completion, how many times uh, the robots finish the disinfection valve. And so, you know, uh, small, but, you know, reliable uh, data here. And then we churn all this uh, through a tier feedback loop. So essentially, we have three tier here. The first tier, you know, collect in the field data with some quick input from operators, uh, automated alerts, you know, for example, the robots has some failure or someone, you know, stop the, the disinfection uh, run Usage uh, analytics, and then using all of that data, uh, we share it with our team with an account manager, who we will then work with a product manager to really make sense of the data. Right. So why did the robot had a failure here? Um, why usage certainly drop? Because right? that's usually like a, a concern if people stop disinfecting the the, the room as you know at a high um, frequency as usual, and then tier three act on the data. So now product manager will start working with engineers uh, to view and test improvement. And all that, you know, we can uh, go, you know, uh, deploy it back to the robot uh, to test in the field uh, and repeat the loop. And so all of this actually allowing us to very quickly uh, get to uh, deployment. Uh, we started developing uh, the uh, UV disinfection robot and get into development within only six months, uh, which is you know a lot faster than the typical time of um, sometimes one to two years 
uh, to really de uh, develop a robot. And allowing us to find early adopters for a pilot and getting valuable feedback. So this is actually very important in healthcare uh, because healthcare hospitals, right, they're very averse to new technology, uh, very conservative. So being able to find these early adopters, uh, sort of like your anchor partners to work with you, uh, to provide you with the knowledge, the feedback is you know, super valuable. And so we, you know, because we have some early uh, demos that were successful, we managed to find these people and get them on board. Um, and then last but not least, working with these people, we managed to solidify uh, the key product values and features uh, to, so that we can build something that really fit into the workflow. Workflow is very important in healthcare because if you make the best solution out there, uh, but if it doesn't fit into uh, the operator's workflow, see they're so busy, right? They're just gonna find reason not to use it. And so these are the things that, uh, that you know, allowing us to uh, really get, uh, start to grow our adoption of our robots. Okay, so yeah, so that's uh, about it. You know, some of the insights and approach that we had uh, to get into uh, hospital without UV discussion robot. Uh, thank you and uh, open up for questions. In Kyoto, um, I think we have time for uh, maybe about three questions. So, uh, um, anybody who would like to uh, to ask Tuk about um, to build the robots or the the relevant use cases that we've talked about, uh, please let me know. Do you need a mic or can I just, yeah, you can, uh, So I'm curious about your experience from going from a robotics company and entering into the healthcare field. Um, what were the hurdles like for the regulatory bodies and some of the procedures and protocols as you enter into there? And then secondly, how easy was it to iterate with all those regulations still kind of um, preventing some of the faster change control uh, procedures that you have to deal with. Yeah, great question. So, uh, question about regulatory and you know how to deal with them, right? Um, so I think you know uh, in healthcare, regulatory is you know, like you have to live with it. But there are certain bodies or departments within healthcare system that have certain type of regulation, and so uh, we look at multiple different use cases. For example, one thing we could do uh, would be indoor delivery of medicine, right? But then that has like a whole, you know, group of, of regulatory uh, requirements that we have to deal with. Uh, UV disinfection luckily has a lot less. It has only to do with infection prevention control. And so uh, that's something that, you know, we can you know, manage a bit uh, better. And so that's why we, we picked this area to go into. Um, and then, um, you know, once we have the uh, prototype and working with um, the hospital, I, it's, I think it's a lot better uh, to roll out changes because then, you know, they sort of trust you already, right? You have to get through like the first uh, demo and all the requirements to prove efficacy, for example, of the robot. Uh, but after that, you know, I, I, we found that it's actually relatively um, easy to continue work with them. As long as you you maintain good relationship. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the very great uh, presentation and the demo that you showed. Um, I'm curious because uh, similarly to my robot at home, where they they clean everywhere, uh, it requires me to open up the door of all the rooms for the robot to come in. And uh, similarly to the video you show. Um, I have to see that I see that you know in op in real operation, you need to open the door for all the room for the robot to come in and crawling into all the room for to do the disinfection. Um, is there any challenge about that? Because this is a real um, practical case for for hospitals, and how do you resolve it in the future? Yeah, so there are a couple of uh, angles here, right? So you know, uh, for right now, uh, a lot of these. Workflow require operators to clean the room before the disinfection, right? So they have to do manual cleaning uh, anyway. Uh, but there are a lot of time in which, let's say, you know, you have like a whole suite of uh, OR, 
multiple rooms, so people can just open the, the door and let the robots roam around and to, you know, do the full disinfection round you know, in one shot. Um, going forward though, we do have a couple of technology um, in the, on the roadmap. So for example, integrate with hospital management system to open doors, controlling the elevators. Right? So these are the things that you know, we're, we are working on right now. And so hopefully we'll uh, like generalize the use case a bit more. So you, um... Hi, I initially you showed um, a human taking the robot around just to train it. Do you think it would be possible in the future that the robot would be able to train itself based on dimension and everything else? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, right? So initially, we thinking about along that way that the robot should be able to train itself and, you know, uh, doing all this, you know, autonomously. And because of all the challenges of the environment and the lack of, of sample, uh, we decided, you know, to go with, like, you know, a sleeper uh, approach. But what it does is actually collecting a lot of training data now uh, for all of this. And so I think definitely, you know, something that we can do uh, in the future. So basically, uh, go into an operating room and identify, you know, like hotspot, right? rather than you know having people to to show it. Uh, but this is the only way that we can collect this data, uh, because you know we don't have any experience uh, in you know infection prevention control, and so yeah. Uh, thank you, Phil. Yeah, I think uh, we uh, good luck. Let's uh, get uh, with the big hand, big hand, and uh, thank you very much. We have, we have a few more questions coming from online. Uh, right. I will talk with you over that. All right. <laughs> Thank you all for the uh, great questions as well. Um, nice. Next, uh, I would like to uh, bring on the stage um, uh, Darmin, uh, who is currently heading uh, Uber AI with a special focus. Uh, on uh, first of all the Michelangelo 